All right, now we're going to get into the good stuff. Welcome back. We're going to look at microscopic examination of urinary sediment, and it's going to be three separate lectures. Uh, this one is going to be on cells. You'll see another on casts and another on crystals, and you'll be able, you'll need to watch all three of them. So when we look at you know cells, we're going to look at how we prep the specimen. Looking at red cells, white cells, epis, bacteria, yeast, sperm, and parasites. So we are going to do a microscopic on a centrifuge sample. Um, if the volume is too small, um, we can try to centrifuge it or examine it uh, directly, but we do have to make a note that it was an uncentrifuge urine simply because of the volume um, decrease. When we looking for an ideal specimen we need about at minimum 10 mls of urine into a centrifuge tube and we're going to centrifuge them at 2000 rpms for about five minutes we're going to now here's the thing i i say pour off um, but you have to be very careful we typically aren't going to pour it off when you're starting because then you'll just dump out all of the fluid um, and then you'll potentially lose some of the sediment um, so we pour off the supernatant um, and we'll resuspend. We save about an ml, um, and we resuspend the sediment um, in the urine. Um, so that's typically um, we do that by like kind of flicking um, the bottom. Uh, sometimes you need to get like a small pipette to be able to mix it up a little bit. Um, make sure it's well mixed. You're going to put a drop of sediment on a slide and a cover slip. Um, typically, we're not using a urine um, counting chambers, um, but if you are at a place like this, um, you're going to fill it from one side to the other, um, and then you're going to look at it. So then once you have it under the scope, you're going to adjust the condenser to provide the greatest contrast. So when we're looking at fluids, we want that condenser down. When we're looking at stain slide, the condenser is up. Um, when we are looking at fluids, the, we want that um, condenser to be down because we're looking at cells that are potentially suspended multiple levels in that urine specimen or fluid specimen. Um, and then we'll adjust the fine adjustment to view the sediment um, in different photos. Local planes. Now remember, when you're initially focusing, you want to use the coarse adjustment. If you use the fine adjustment too much, you'll lock up your stage. Um, we're going to look at low power, um, so that's your 10x, um, and that will look to scan for casts and epithelial cells, um, and then high dry power, so your 40 objective to look at everything else. And then we're going to have to use a reporting system um, that's specific to um, your facility. Um, I will give you ours um, for our laboratory and kind of go over how I'd like you um, to report um, for us. Each clinical or each laboratory um, will have a different way of reporting, um, so you'll have to follow that when you get in there. So. When we start out looking at urinary sediment, one of the most common things we're going to see are red blood cells. Um, so they can um, have originated anywhere from in the urinary tract from the glomerulus all the way down to your urethral metis, and they can be a contamination um, from a female's menstrual cycle. Um, we can see injury or rupture of the vessels of the kidney or urinary tract releasing these urine these red cells into the urine, um, but it doesn't account for normal presence of a few red cells in the urine and we can see red cells in different forms depending on the environment of the urine. So all of these are uh, red blood cells. They look small. Here's an epithelial cell right here. Um, so typically, um, or squamous epithelial, excuse me, um, so we can see ghost cells, which are basically the membranes. We can see um, red cells on their side, so they kind of look like a dumbbell, flat where they look like the donut, or we can see them crenated where their membrane is, is being challenged by the environment that it's in, and it's pulling um, the red cell membrane. So we can, oops, I already told you that part. Um, so we can um, see red cells being confused with white cells, um, if they're crenated, and that's the spiky, basically it looks like a little spiky ball. Yeast can often be mistaken for red cells, and then after initial um, observation and enumeration, um, we can actually put a drop of um, acid um, to diffuse out, and the red cells will lyse, so we can confirm the presence or absence of yeast. 
Um, so here's some more red blood cells. So here's your typical donut looking red blood cells. Um, so these are the typical cells that we see in a blood smear. Um, and then while you um, find focus, they will seem to pop out and have darker circles around them. Um, so these will look a little more refractile because they're thicker on the edges. Um, and this won't occur if the red cells are distorted or, uh, by hypotonic or hypertonic in urine environments. So um, these uh, urine red blood cells, will we want to correlate with the blood on the reagent strip. Usually we're going to see a positive protein as well. Uh, here's so these are um, some using different types of microscopy and stain so this actually I like this even though we don't use stain in the lab um, I like this because this helps you really see on a PowerPoint the crenated cells so see these look these are the crenated cells these are normal looking cells um, and these are face contrast so we move into white blood cells. Um, these can enter anywhere in the urinary tract. They're larger than red cells, but smaller than renal cells. Um, we can see them in clumps, and they're usually neutrophils. So you can actually see the granules and then the nucleus um, right here of these white blood cells. Um, so on average, the normal urine can have about two white blood cells per high power field. Um, so cells are approximately 10 to 12. Um, micrometers in diameter, they're again larger than red cells but smaller than renal epis. This is an example of a white cell clump. Um, so typically we can usually see the granules in the, in the lobes of the nucleus. Um, we can add acetic acid to accentuate the nuclei um, and leukocytes will shrink in hypertonic um, urine or swell um, in hypotonic or alkaline urine um, and the number of white cells in alkaline and hypotonic tonic urine will decrease by 50% within one hour of collection if the specimens kept at room temp. So we want to make sure that we're looking at these um, sediments uh, within an hour of collection. So we, when we can see these um, in a hypotonic uh, urine, the granules will actually potentially demonstrate Brownian movement, and these are kind of fun. Um, these are called glitter cells, um, and basically the cells will shimmer at you with all the the granules moving. Um, they used to be considered specific for pyelonephritis, but we can see um, this happen if the cells are exposed to that hypotonic environment. So we can see white cells in the sediment um, increase during inflammation. So in your renal system, it's infectious pyelonephritis or cystitis, glomerulonephritis, renal tubular, whoops, typo, um, dehydration, stress, and fever. Um, extra renal would be irritation of the ureter, bladder, or urethra, appendicitis, another typo, sorry about that. Um, sometimes when I talk to text, it doesn't understand my language. Um, and then pancreatitis. So here's some stained white cells as well, but remember we don't use stain typically um, in the lab, and then some uh, con phase contrast as well. So we need to make a distinction amongst urinary epithelial cells, um, simply because the epithelial cells themselves are going to arise from different loci. Um, uh, so we want to be sure that we know where they're coming from because that's going to tell us the patient's disease state. So renal epis will originate in the convoluted tubules, transitional in the renal pelvis to the upper urethra, and squamous are the lower urethra or vaginal contamination. Um, so you see your A, your transitional cell, your B is your renal epithelial cell, and then your white cells are the smallest. So when we look at tubular epithelial cells or renal tubular epithelial cells, they're larger than white cells. They can have a round nucleus. They can be flat, cuboidal, or columnar. Um, we'll see an increased number of tubular epithelial cells um, in pyelonephritis, um, acute tubular necrosis, salicylate intoxication, or if the um, patient has gotten a kidney transplant and it's in the process of rejection. So here's some um, renal epithelial cells, almost cuboidal here. Um, we can also see oval fat bodies, and these are um, basically renal epithelial cells um, that have fat incorporated into them. Um, so they're typically um, the renal cells that are um, degrading. Um, we can also see lipophages as well. Um, it's the same oval fat body.
There's another oval fat body. This is a fiber right here, and then an oval fat body. Um, this, again, you can almost see the, the slight discoloration. Um, so this is an oval fat, and then you can see some white cells as well. Um, the fat itself, if there's free-floating fat or fat that's incorporated into a cell or a cast, um, is either composed of cholesterol, esters, or free cholesterol. Um, this form of fat is anisotrophic, so it will form the Maltese crosses under polarized light, but they won't stain with fat stains. So you can see this is the Maltese cross. And here is the Sudan 3 that stained um, the fat droplets itself. So um, fat is not detected by any of our chemical tests. Um, fatty degeneration of the tubules um, can occur in chronic glomerular nephritis, diabetes mellitus, eclampsia, preeclampsia, lipid nephrosis, nephrotic syndrome, and toxic renal poisoning, or if we have a fat embolism, or if there's extensive injuries with crushing of subcutaneous fat, or fractures of long bones. So then we move into transitional epithelial cells. So here's transitional cells. Um, these are two to four times as large as white cells. They can be round, pear-shaped, or have tail-like projections. And occasionally um, they can have two nuclei. They will line the urinary tract from the pelvis of the kidney to the upper portion of the urethra. So these are a ton of white blood cells and then your transitional epithelial cells. So you can see the difference in how much larger they are um, than the white blood cells. Um, these are stained, um, so these are white blood cells here, and then you have some transitional epis as well. Then squamous epithelial cells, we are often um, seeing these in the urine, uh, especially a non-clean catch or non-midstream clean catch urine. Um, so they're easily recognized because they're flat, irregular shaped cells. They have a small central nuclei, um, lots of cytoplasm. Sometimes we can see them rolled, it, rolled or folded over or cylindrical. Um, these occur primarily in the urethra and the vagina. Um, so many of these squamous cells um, in a female are contamination from the vagina and the vulva. So typically they're not having any diagnostic significance. So um, here are, again, these are some of the um, red blood cells and you can see some of them kind of look like um, the dumbbell shapes on their side. And then you can see the stained uh, epithelial cells, squamous epithelial cells. So when we look at bacteria in the urine, um, normally we don't see any bacteria present in regular urine. Um, we can see contamination from the urethra, the vagina, or external sources, and we report them as few, moderate, many. Nitri nitrite might be positive, but not always, because remember, if you don't have a nitrate-reducing bacteria, it will not produce nitrite. Um, white cells can be present, um, and these will more accurately reflect infection than a nitrite itself. Um, so here's some bacteria. You can see short little chains, some clumps, and then a very long chain of bacteria. Here's some more. Here's a white cell right here. More bacteria. Yeast. Um, they look like little footprints, don't they? Um, but if you cover up this spot right here and you just look at this, it can definitely be mistaken for a red blood cell. Um, so we can see just one yeast, um, or we can see budding yeast or pseudo hyphae. Um, so Candida albicans is the most common yeast that we see. Um, so here's some budding yeast as well. And then here is yeast with pseudohyphae. Um, so we can also see this. Typically, the pseudohyphae is more common in the urine that's been sitting for a while and not a freshly voided urine. Um, we can also see um, sperm present in the urine. So they're oval bodies with long tails. And we can see them in the urine of men and women. Urinary sediment parasites. Yummy, yummy, yummy. No. Um, so the we can see parasites that are indigenous to the urinary tract. We can see them as vaginal or fecal contamination. Um, there's no chemical analysis available for urinary parasites. And we can also see white blood cells present. So this is trichomonas right here. 
So Trigomonas vaginalis is the most commonly occurring um, parasite. It's a flagellate organism, or uh, parasite in urine. Um, it's a flagellate organism, same size as a, a big white blood cell. Um, so we cannot report this unless it's modal um, because you'll see it kind of like the flapping, you know, motion. Um, so sometimes when bacteria are next to a cell, it can be mistaken for trigomonas. So motility is the diagnostic feature. Um, and it can be found in males, although it's more common in females. Um, and trigomonas vaginalis is frequently accompanied by white cells and epithelial cells. Um, you do have to be careful if you're going to report this on a little kid. You want to make sure that you are getting this confirmed um, by a supervisor before you report it out simply because um, this is not something that someone will accidentally occur and it's a very concerning if a child might have that. Um, other things that other parasites, Enterobias vermicularis, so this is pinworm. So we can see ova and occasionally the female worm. Um, they're very characteristic in shape. Um, so the ova has a flat side and one rounded side, and you can actually usually see the developing larva um, through the transparent shell of the egg. Pretty cool looking, but gross. Um, so this is um, the adult female. Um, if the urine is found to contain many pinworm ova, examination of the original urine container usually or sometimes can um, reveal the adult worm. Um, so this is the head of an adult female Enterobias vermicularis. Uh, schistosoma hematobium is another parasite that we can see in the urine. Um, so the um, it's a blood fluke that will inhabit the veins in the walls of the urinary bladder. Um, the adult will deposit eggs in the capillaries of the mucosa. We can see abscesses that develop around the eggs, and then we can see eggs in the in the urine accompanied by red cells and white cells. Um, so this type of schistosomiasis is endemic in Africa, um, Nile Valley, Middle East, and around the Mediterranean. Um, so it has characteristic terminal spine. Um, so there's a couple different schistosomas, um, but this uh, schistosoma hematomium is the one that we commonly see in urine. Um, and it measures about 50 microns by 150 microns. So other confusing things that we can see um, in the urine are some artifacts like fecal contamination, air bubbles, droplets, hairs, fibers, things like that. Um, so this is fecal contamination. So we can see vegetable fibers, muscle fibers, tissue strands, things like that. Um, these can be confused um, for cells or other things like triple FOSS. Um, you know, this actually has triple FOSS. But as you can see here, if this was covered up, you'd think that this was potentially, you know, something else. Um, and obviously this is all digested um, fi uh, plant fiber. So um, air bubbles, so these are both air bubbles, um, and this in the background is amorphous uh, phosphates, and we'll talk more about crystals um, in the crystals lecture. Um, air bubbles can have a different um, variety of shapes, but they're very characteristic about the heavy, 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 heavy black outline. So this is just, just a little closer, so there's a couple, there's three air bubbles in this. Oil droplets um, in the urine are the result of contamination from lubricants, um, and they're spherical and can vary in size, and oil can also be con um, confused for a free-floating uh, fat droplet. And that is urinary cells in the sediment. Um, so your uh, lecture test code is 23 five five